So while we get the slides up, I was going to say welcome to the picture show part of the presentation since I'm going to be covering trademark, copyright, law, and trade dress, but we already got a taste of that with Willy Wonka. So, but I, I hope to give you a couple more pictures here today. Um, my name is Eric Ball, and I will be running through trademark, trade dress, and copyright law in the gaming space over the last couple of years. Um, I hope at the end of this discussion, if we do have my slides, that we will, uh, I'll get you guys all to level up to the next, the next level in the game, and we can defend our games from frivolous allegations or go after those cloners that we see so frequently copying our games. Just a second for our slides. So our first topic that I want to run through today is trademark. And in trademark law, what we're continuing to see is that the Rogers defense is a strong defense when you are wanting to use a third party's trademark in your game. This is a defense that started in the Second Circuit. It's been widely adopted throughout, throughout the rest of the US and essentially allows you to take someone's mark, someone else's mark that you don't own, and put it in your game if it has artistic relevance to the game, and it's not explicitly misleading. So if you are doing, um, kind of, if you want to show a Starbucks coffee restaurant in Grand Theft Auto because someone's gonna go rob that Starbucks coffee, you can do that probably, because it's artistically relevant to the game, and it's not explicitly misleading. What we're gonna see from these cases is that the bar for artistic relevance is generally pretty low, and a bar for explicitly misleading has been pretty high in the recent past. So our first example here is the Gran Turismo case um, with the Virage signing. Now, Virage didn't like that their trademark was being used in the Gran Turismo game. This is a depiction of the Monza track in Italy, you know, a realistic depiction of what the track actually looks like. And the court said, on a motion to dismiss, no, the Rogers defense applies. Why? Because this signage was artistically relevant to the game. They were trying to make a realistic depiction of the actual Monza track. It also wasn't explicitly misleading. There wasn't any facts suggesting that they were saying that Virage sponsored or affiliated the Gran Turismo game. Now, the pr one of the practice tips here, go ahead. Well, I just, uh, just a question about that. Is, is the timing, so the sponsorship rotates and these games might have a longer life than the sponsorship too. So if this, if, if this is in here for verisimilitude and then the sponsor changes, do you have any obligation? You, I, under the Rogers defense, I wouldn't expect you to be creating a claim because it's not, it's still not explicitly misleading just to have signage in your game, just like my uh, Starbucks example. Um, I mean, what I was gonna say is one practice tip is there were others that were paid for signages in that game. And I think that's one thing to think about. That's one reason why Virage might have been upset. They wanted a piece of that pie as well. So just something to think about. If you're gonna pay some people, maybe you should be paying others as well and save yourself a lawsuit. The next example is our, an Angry Monkey case uh, from Call of Duty. The, on the left, you have the Angry Monkey patch, which is a patch sold that various soldiers use in the real world. They put this on their uniforms to signify that they're you know, part of the followers of the Angry Monkey. And in Call of Duty, you also have this patch available that you can put on your soldiers in the Call of Duty. Again, the court said, Roger's defense applies. It's artistically relevant. Soldiers use this angry monkey patch in the real world. We're trying to make a realistic game, and it's not explicitly misleading. The, what took this case to the next step was Call of Duty didn't just use it in the gameplay itself. They, there was a snippet of gameplay in a commercial, and the angry monkey folks said, hey, that snippet in that commercial, you're showing our patch in that commercial. And because of that, you know, it's not just First Amendment, right of free expression, Rogers defense, you're now trying to commercialize our trademark. The court said no, that little small snippet does not take it out of the Rogers defense territory. Now, my practice up here is I wouldn't use someone else's trademark as a prominent part of your commercial, 
But if it's a snippet of real gameplay, under this case, you'll probably be okay. And our last example of the Rogers defense, and it's probably the most extreme example of where it protected you, is you have Rebellion Developments on the left. They own the Rebellion trademark for game. And on the right, you have Sins of a Solar Empire, Rebellion. And so, not unlike in the prior case where you have Angry Monkey, they own it for military patches, or Barrage, it was a flooring company. Here you have a gaming company with the name Rebellion trying to sue another game that's actually using Rebellion in the title of the game. But again, the court still said that the Rogers defense applies. And the other interesting fact, there was actual confusion or allegations of actual confusion in the Rebellion case. And the court said, no, the Rogers defense still applies because one, it's artistically relevant. This was when you played Sins of a Solar Empire, you were either a loyalist or a rebel in this galactic battle. So that made it artistically relevant. And there wasn't any explicit misleading. Rebellion didn't have the facts to show that the Sins of the Solar Empire folks were trying to mislead people that was coming from Rebellion games. You know, just be, there was an idea, there's a reason why we use the word rebellion in a game. You know, it's your fighting. So there wasn't, they were trying to play off the Rebellion games folks. So my overall takeaway from our, all of these cases is again, that the, the bar for artistic relevance seems pretty low and a bar for explicitly misleading seems high. You're gonna need something more than your general likelihood of confusion test in trademark law. The next topic that I had is trade dress. And two things I wanted to raise before we walk through some of the cases in trade dress is, one, I'm seeing more and more companies use trade dress to protect their games and go after third parties, rather than just using what we have copy. We normally would see copyright claims, but now I'm more and more I'm seeing trade dress claims, especially in the game cloning context. So take a look at, you know, when you're making those allegations or when you're thinking about protecting your game, think of trade dress as well. And the second one is trade dress claims are more commonly covered by insurance than um, copyright claims or trademark claims are. Often there is a clause in your insurance policy that says covers advertising and trade dress. You know, it has a, it has a trademark litigation exclusion, it has a copyright litigation exclusion, but it still covers advertising and trade dress. And so if you get hit with a trade dress claim, or your clients get hit with a trade dress claim, double check those policies. And if you're thinking of pursuing a trade dress claim, make, you know, know that you might be triggering somebody's policy and they might get coverage and have a, a more of an opportunity to, to fight you. So what is trade dress? It protects the look and feel of your game in a way that identifies the source of the game and distinguishes it from others. So that's that trademark aspect of trade dress. To prove trade dress, it's gotta be non-functional, so it, ha it can't be how the game works. It's gotta have acquired secondary meaning. You normally prove this through surveys, advertising, customer sales, and that secondary meaning essentially means that when someone sees that trade dress, they see those sounds, colors, sights, they know that that game is coming from King or EA or Sega. They know who, that game, who the source of that game is. And the last one is your standard likelihood of confusion test that you see in trademark law. So how is trade dress different from patent or copyright? One, trade dress doesn't require originality. You can have, just, just like in trademark law, you can have a Delta Airlines and a Delta Faucets. You can have two companies with the same trade dress. You don't have to be the original creator of that trade dress as long as there's not confusion. Two, it doesn't cover functional elements. Like I said, it's gotta be non-functional. That's where you go to patent law. Three, it arises from consumer recognition. It doesn't come at the time of creation like you have with patent or copyright law. And the last one is, much like trade secret law and trademark law in general, its rights can be unlimited in time as long as you're still using it. Whereas patent, you've got 20 years or so. Copyright law, you know, in the gaming world, copyright law might be unlimited these days just because it's such a long tail, um, practically speaking but trade dress is unlimited in time. So walking through two classic trade dress cases first here, you have the Golden Tee case, which um, here got two arcade games and the court found that the trackball 
design of the game was functional. That was how you swung the golf club. So that was not a protectable trade dress. On the flip side, our classic Tetris case. And here the court says this was a protectable trade dress. It wasn't functional. The way the blocks were, yes, the blocks, you know, they interconnect with the other blocks and they, you know, disappear and the like, but you could have done this with candies or balls or, you know, just general circles. You didn't have to use these exact same square blocks and the exact same style blocks on each side. You could have done triangles even or, or other cube shapes. And then on secondary meeting, you know, after sales, advertising, customer recognition, when people see the game on the left, they're thinking Tetris, and that was the, that was the, where the trade dress acquired secondary meaning. And then on confusion, when someone sees the game on the right, they're likely to be confused on who the source of that game was. So the court found that Tetris had protectable trade dress. One recent trade dress case that we were involved in was the glue versus hothead case. Now we had copyright claims as well in this case, but the trade dress copyright only goes so far. You might not think that these two games are substantially similar because a deer is not a, is not a soldier on your first blush. But in trade dress, you can, you know, you can have a similar look and feel between this one and the next slide I'll show you, but you have a waterfall in the background on both of them, an unsuspecting target in the foreground, you have the start and begin button in the same similar spots, the mission objective, are in different spots, but they have similar prominence and style. Here's another example from the complaint. You've got a similar you know, way to sight the gun, tap and zoom. And so there's a, there's a similar look and feel between these, these two. And I just want to read the allegation from the complaint that's summarizing the trade dress of, Glue has a unique design, or a unique and distinctive product line, whereby Glue has combined accuracy, hunting, infrared imaging, alertness, economic models, layout, arrangement, and visual presentation of features, sequence and flow, and various other elements into a mobile game. And that was the summary of the trade dress. One of the things you'll see often in trade dress complaints, and one of the difficulties um, on the plaintiff and defense side is defining that trade dress early on. If you're too vague, I've seen courts grant the motion to dismiss, because you can't just say, the game's my trade dress. You gotta really kind of spell it out. Because um, if you are just saying the game is my trade dress, then the court is either motion for a definitive statement or just motion for failure to state a claim. They want a little more specificity here. And here we gave it to them. Ultimately, the parties reached a settlement in this case, but it is an example of how you can use trade dress to protect your client or your games. The next topic that I have is copyright law. And we under copyright cases recently, we're still continuing to see uh, game clones um, coming coming down the pipe. And here we have another case that we were involved in, uh, King versus Six Waves. Uh, you have Farm Hero Saga on the left-hand side. King makes you know Candy Crush and you know its saga lines of games. On the right, you have Farm Epic. Here you have another example of what Six Waves did. On the left, you have our Pet Rescue Saga. And on the right, you have Treasure Epic. And King asserted its copyright claims in you know, the sights, the sounds, of, and, and, and how the game played in the sense of how the you know, images disappeared. Ultimately, after some initial procedural and forum motions that we won, the case was resolved with a stipulated injunction and a significant monetary payment. This is all out in a press, press release, so this is out there in the public. And you know, King, and we were pretty pleased on how we were able to resolve this case. This is an example of using copyright law to protect your case against cloners. The other thing I would say on, on this case, that kind of a, a reminder in general, is be mindful for your clients and your game developers out there, what they're saying when they're developing a game. You know, don't say, I'm, Let's go copy that really famous game that's out there right now. <laughs> Let's go, you know, I, I really liked and I'm inspired. I wanna do this, this, and this that I saw in that game. You know, those Skype logs, those chat logs, those emails are gonna come back to bite you. And when you're on the plaintiff's side and you think you saw someone's game out there that seems pretty similar to yours, 
there's a good chance that there's going to be email communications on the other side where the guy is saying when he's developing it, hey, I want to go copy Glue's latest game, you know, or let's go mimic that game. Um, we've all seen those in the industry. The next case that I want to walk through is NBA 2K16. Now this game uh, from 2K Games just in Take Two just seems to be keep getting hit with uh, litigation. First there was uh, the classic copyright claim based on a sample of the music in the soundtrack for the game. Someone said, I own a piece of that music sample in, in that game. And that one settled or was resolved, dismissed shortly after filing. So we don't really know what happened in that case. But the second and ongoing situation is regarding the tattoos of the players in the game. Uh, we have an early decision that I'll talk about in a second, but essentially, you have, you, know, you, got, you got LeBron in the upper right hand corner, you can see some of his tattoos. Well, those tattoos are recreated in the game because it's trying to be a very realistic game. Now, you, the tattoo artist has a copyright in those tattoos. You can own your tattoo, you can own a copyright in that tattoo even if you put it on somebody else. Um, he hasn't assigned away the copyright. One of my takeaways is get a work for hire agreement from your tattoo artist, possibly. <laughs> um, one of the, the, the early decision that we have out of this case is on the statutory damages context. Uh, Solid Oak was, is trying to claim statutory damages and what they said, what the court said is, no, you can't get statutory damages because you, in order to get statutory damages, you have to have registered your copyright before the alleged infringement occurred. Here, the alleged infringement occurred starting in with 2K13, 2K14, earlier versions of the game, Copyright was registered in 15, 2015, and now you have another version of the game in 2K, with 2K16. The court said, no, those were all similar uses or nearly identical uses of that same allegedly infringing work, that same tattoo. LeBron's tattoo didn't change over time. It was just a recreation of that same tattoo. And so the court said, you can't get around the statutory damages rule. They said, the first, Solid Oak tried to say, well, there was a one year gap so this is new infringement, you know, between 2014 and 2015 and 2016 when we re-released the game. The court says, no, that doesn't get around the rule. And I think that's important for especially game, um, games that are serially released. There are the new versions, of like a Madden game, most sports games that come out every single year. If there's an alleged infringement early and then there's a registration, you should be protected from uh, statutory damages. Second way they try to get around the statutory damages rule. So they said, well, the new tattoos, because the game got better, they're crisper and more exacting. You can really see the detail. And the court said again, no, it's still pretty much the same tattoo. Just, you know, fine tuning the details doesn't make it a new, a, a new uh, infringing act. And then the last way they said was, well, NBA 2K16, they knew what they were doing. They were, they were willful infringers. They're the bad guys here. We shouldn't let them get away with it. And the court says there's no willfulness exception to the statutory damages timing requirement. So again, right now, Solid Oak is out of luck on statutory damages. And the other takeaway from this case is, you know, if you're going to pursue, as a plaintiff, any kind of statutory damages claim, remember to get your copyrights registered early and often. How much, <coughs> how much less are not are, are other damages? Well, you got to prove you got to prove actual damages then. So, you know, is this guy really hurt? Is the value of his copyright, the value of his tattoo, that much diminished? Did he lose, you know, value to tattoos, or did he maybe get um, a better promotion of his tattoo mm -hmm. out there that others might see LeBron's tattoo in the game and want to go, you know, go to that same tattoo artist? That's why you see a lot of statutory damages in the music context and the like. The last case in the copyright space that I wanted to run through is this recent case from the Ninth Circuit. And this is kind of the opposite of what we see in many of our gaming cases. Instead of copyright law going into the game, here you have copyright law coming out of the game. On the right hand side, you have the classic icon that hovers above a character's head in any, any Sims, Sims game, like so Sim City. Uh, this is called the Plum Bob. And on the left hand side was a, a potentially derivative work, um, which was a USB drive or a thumb drive that someone created based on that uh, plumb bob. Now 
there was, in this case, there's more uh, licensing issues and some trade secrets issues as well, but what I wanted to focus on here is the court's decision on whether or not the work on the left qualifies for independent copyright protection because it is a derivative work. To be a derivative work, it has to have non-trivial differences and it has to be non-functional. The district court said the differences weren't enough. It's, you know, you're just taking it and turning it into a USB drive. It looks enough like their regular Plum Bob and Sim. Summary judgment granted, go away. Ninth Circuit says, you know what, let's take a second look. Maybe there's enough differences, there's enough questions of fact out there. And that's because apparently the work on the left is a very futuristic design. They use the word futuristic a number of times in the uh, decision. I, I don't think the Ninth Circuit's calling it necessarily futuristic, but that was the question of fact, is whether or not this was really a futuristic design in, that was discussed in the email. So that made it non-trivial and non-functional. And then the second part was that there were multiple other designs that they picked from to create this uh, thumb drive. And it said since there was other designs out there, again, that's why it was non-functional and had artistic qualities that gave it a derivative work. The third kind of important part of this case that from the Ninth Circuit in this decision is that what they said, maybe this futuristic design has non-trivial differences, but just because you go from a nine-sided uh, plum bob to a 20-sided plum bob, that's not enough to be a non-trivial differences. And there they cited the recent Batmobile case. They mm -hmm. said just because the Batmobile has changed over time doesn't mean that it loses its copyrightability and that it's not a copyrightable work. So that's trademark, trade dress, and copyright law. The last part that I had is what's next. So given the realism that's kind of being pushed into mini games, there's two areas where I think I could see claims coming down the pipe. And the first is in building design. And they think of your buildings being, real life buildings being depicted in your game. <coughs> now you can have a copyright in a building design, but you also can recre recreate that building in a game. There's an exception to the, in the Copyright Act allowing you to reproduce that building as long as it's a publicly available building. You can also have a trademark in your co in your building. That on the right hand side is the trademark for the Empire State Building. Um, but as we've seen with the Rogers defense, if it's artistically relevant, you know, if you're trying to have a game in Manhattan that that's about Manhattan, you can recreate the that same uh, building in your game. But the Rogers defense only goes so far. And here's a trademark case, you know, involving beer. And it, on the left hand side, someone took the Empire State Building and put it in their actual logo. And here's where I think, you know, you could have an issue where someone could call it explicitly misleading or could maybe go too far. The exception being the Rebellion case, but if someone had a Call of Duty Defend Seattle and they put the Seattle Space Needle as the primary trademark for that game, I could see someone saying, that's gone too far, you gotta stop and take my trademark out of that game's logo. The last one I have for you guys today is this recent case from uh, the graffiti artist Rhyme, well, actual name Joseph Tierney against Moschino. On the left, you have his Vandal's Eyes graffiti that he uh, did, I, I believe in New York. And on the right, you had it re recreated in various clothing articles by Moschino. On the far right, the most uh, famously by Katy Perry at a Met Gala. He wasn't too fond of this. You know, he wanted his cut as well, he actually makes clothing or has turned some of his graffiti art into clothing, so you can understand why he was a li little perturbed. On Initially, he got past the motion to dismiss. He also has trademark rights in the, uh, in the vandalized. And he got in, there's a little insignia, I don't know if you can see it, that has like kind of his name as part of the vandalized and that's recreated in the art, in the dresses and the jacket. And initially he got past a motion to dismiss on a Rogers defense because they said there was enough questions of fact, move on to the next stage. Moschino then files a summary judgment motion saying, graffiti's illegal. You can't have a copyright in an illegal work. Uh, they settled the next day after the, after the motion for summary judgment was filed. I'm sure the settlement was already in the works, I would expect. You normally don't settle 
that quickly in the face of a summary judgment motion. So unfortunately, we don't have a final order. There was recently a case filed against McDonald's because it used some graffiti in its one of its uh, uh, commercials. A similar kind of case where the graffiti artist is now suing McDonald's for the use of its graffiti. So my tip out there for you game the game developers are if you're gonna use someone's graffiti create your own graffiti or get a license for that graffiti it might be hard to get a license for that graffiti mm -hmm. though um, walking down the streets and finding who actually made it so that I could see that coming down the pipe at some point so I hope we've all been able to level up here and like Scott Pilgrim or Michael Sarah you can use your new fancy sword and fight the game cloners and defend your game against frivolous allegations thank you guys all Jennifer, if you're in the stands as well, do lead counsel on the case. What do you mean, what was the copyright on? What were the games in? No, the, we had the picture, uh, screenshots that they took. Right, Pet Rescue Saga and Farm Girl Saga. Right, yeah. so what the copyright was on. Well, we, we argued it with a lot of a lot of different people, but just the color, the shape, the movement, the sequencing of events um, for Pet Rescue Saga game, because if you would actually play the game, it has that element of taking the interactive with the game. Yeah. And so I mean, it's you know the sights, the sounds, the colors of the candy, the sequence of the game. When you go through all the complaints, there's a lot of you know sometimes when they disappear, the way the same movement that they're disappearing is is similar. So there's I mean there's you can't all do it justice in w one copy, you know one image side by side. And then in the uh, in the Bluey case, we also argued that there were a lot of similarities in the tutorial, that 18 of the 21 steps were the same, and so I think we might have even had a chart in the complaint that laid it out. Yeah. These are just two of the similar tu tu tutorial images telling you how to sight your gun. Well, I actually have a, a comment on a question that came on the, uh, on the copyright piece of it. Um, I always urge my clients to register their copyrights, not, not only because you have to have a registration before you can file a lawsuit, but because then you're eligible not just for statutory damages, but for attorney's fees, and that can provide significant leverage So for the webcasters and those at home and in the future, Jennifer just made a good point of registering your copyright not only gives you statutory damages, but attorney's fees. And especially after the recent Supreme Court case in Kurtzang, where they fuzzied or lowered the bar on being able to capture attorney's fees on both the plaintiff and the defendant side in a copyright case. It makes much more sense to register your copyrights again early and often. And they're much simpler to register than a, than a patent. Trademark rights. Say it has a force. Say you have a force. You know, kind of yeah. signage. It, you know, is where's the is the artistic expression. I mean, is it artistically relevant to that to that VR home space? Is the first question. And then it's probably not going to be explicitly, explicitly misleading. I'd have to kind of you know think about is someone thinking that Porsche is sponsoring or being affiliated with that home space? Are you you know also trying to sell? cars or, 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 or trying to promote yourself as a car salesman in that VR home space. I mean, that's those are the kind of the issues and facts that, that come involved. But it's the, going back to some of what we were talking about in the patent context, the Rogers defense is a balance between the First Amendment <laughs> right of free expression and trying to allow people to use things that are out there in the real world versus your trademark rights. And you know, most of the time someone's not going to be confused because they see that Porsche 
logos 